I believe that some of the worst pain that we experience in life comes from people falsely accusing us and judging us. When they don't know us or they don't know anything about us and they don't bother to find out, they just take a look and have an opinion. How many of you have ever been hurt deeply by someone who judged you and criticized you and you just thought, you don't even know what you're talking about? Well, one of the best ways to keep those kind of things from happening to us is not to dish it out to other people. And so what I want to talk to you about tonight is not being quick to judge. We never have enough information to judge anyone. I want you to remember that. We never, not one of us ever has enough information to judge anyone critically. We know what we know, but the interesting thing is, is we don't know what we don't know. And there's a lot more that we don't know than that we know, usually about every individual. We're going to start by looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2. 1 Corinthians 4, 2. Paul was talking about the requirements of an apostle, what it, what it took to be an apostle. And he said, it is essentially required of stewards that a man should be found faithful, proving himself worthy of trust. But as for me personally, it matters very little to me that I should be put on trial by you on this point and that you or any other human tribunal should investigate and question and cross-question me. So obviously, just like we put up with today, Paul was in the public eye. He was, God was trying to use him. He was trying to help people. I'm sure he wasn't perfect, just like none of us are perfect. And the people were judging him. You know, Satan, one of his names is the accuser of the brethren. And we need to be a lot more careful about the thoughts that come into our minds about other people because very often it is just Satan putting lies into our thoughts. And we have to learn to go to God with those thoughts and say, now is this really something that's true? Or is this just my carnal mind having an opinion that I don't need to have? It is amazing how much more peace we can have. How many of you want more peace? It is unbelievable how much more peace you can have. I can guarantee you a huge percentage of increase in your peace if you will just go home and mind your own business. <laughs> and actually there is a scripture for that too. <laughs> just mind your own business. We always want to have an opinion about everything. And I've learned that I don't need to have an opinion where I don't have any responsibility. <laughs> if it's not my responsibility, then I don't need to get involved in it and have an opinion. So Paul's trying to help people. I don't think there's anything any more hurtful than when you're trying to help people and you're actually making sacrifices to do that and they still find something wrong with the way you're trying to do it. And the more people that you can help, strangely enough, there's more of them that can have an opinion about you. So if you're the boss at work, more people are going to have an opinion about you than if you were just a regular employee. Every time you get a promotion, it sounds exciting at first, but I can tell you, new level always brings new devil. <laughs> can anybody say amen? Amen. Hallelujah. You get a nice new big house, some of your friends are going to judge you for that house. It's interesting to me that nobody ever judges me or nobody ever judges you if they have what you have. People only judge us when they don't have what we have. And so therefore, it's not even really accurate thinking or even really what the word true judgment is all about. It's just jealousy. It's just, and, and they're not even mad because you have it, they're mad because they don't have it. 
So what do we do about all this judgment? Well, first of all, let's just talk for a minute about the judgment that comes toward us because I'm sure you'd rather talk about that than not judging other people. But I'm only going to talk about it for a few minutes and then we're leaving it and going on to something else. So you can enjoy this for the next three or four minutes and that's it. Paul said, I don't care what you think of me. Your opinion of me does not matter at all. Well, you got to know your heart pretty good to be able to say that. And it is important that we know our own heart because God is a God of hearts. A person's behavior may not always be right. It may be hard to understand them sometimes. And we can judge people's behavior. You, the more you know about the Word of God, the more you're going to recognize wrong behavior. When we get born again, we don't become stupid. We actually get smarter. We get wiser. And we're more knowledgeable. And, and sadly to say, the more we read about what's right, sometimes the quicker we become to judge what's wrong. And so we can judge behavior. The Bible says you will know them by their fruit. But what we must not judge is the heart, the person themselves. We can, when we see somebody with bad behavior, we need to pray. Don't ever have an opinion about anything you haven't prayed about. We should not gossip. We should go to God and pray. And then, and only then, if we feel that we're led by the Spirit to do it and it's for the benefit of the other person, the Bible lays out a plan on how to go to the person privately and share with them what you see biblically that's wrong in their behavior and ask them to correct it for their own sake and the sake of everyone else. So it's not about not confronting people. And sometimes when you try to teach about not judging, especially a person who loves God and wants to do what's right, they can easily come to the point then where their answer to everything is, well, I'm not, don't judge, don't judge. I'm not going to judge. I'm not going to judge. And then what happens is nothing ever gets dealt with. Nothing gets dealt with in the church. Nothing gets dealt with in relationships. And that's not good either. We need to know how to deal with things, but we need to know how to deal with them. Now listen to what I'm going to say. With an attitude of humility, not trying to take the speck out of somebody else's eye when we have a telephone pole in our own eye. <laughs> Amen. Now how many of you, just help me, let me know I've got the right crowd. How many of you are a little too opinionated? Well, bless the Lord, oh my soul. He's brought the right people together with the right message. And I can tell you when we judge people and we pass our opinions on about them, we have bad night's sleep. We don't even know what it's about. We lose our joy. We feel a heaviness in our life. We don't get it. We don't know what's wrong. We go around rebuking devils. Then somebody comes around and they're judging us and we're mad at them. And the truth is, is we're reaping off of the seed that we've sown. Now, they're going to reap too. But it's amazing how we get mad at other people for doing the same thing that we do to people. You know, a lot of us are just clueless about our own behavior. We see everything that everybody else does, but we just don't get it when it comes to us. So before we ever have an opinion about anybody else, we need to make sure that we have thoroughly examined ourselves, looked at ourselves, and then we need to say, God, I don't know their heart. I can see their behavior's wrong. You've taught me that from the Word. But I don't know their heart. I don't know why they're behaving that way. I don't know what's happened to them in their life. I know being abused in my childhood, I had a lot of weird behavior. I mean, I had a lot of quirky personality traits and people would sometimes say to me, what is wrong with you? And I'm thinking, what do you mean what is wrong with me? I, what are you talking about? I didn't think anything was wrong with me. I thought something was wrong with all of them. <laughs> and they did that because they could only see my behavior, but they couldn't see my heart. And a lot of times, if we don't like someone's behavior, we don't even bother to try to get to know them. And that's one of the reasons why we don't get to help as many people as we could help. It takes time to get to know someone. 
So we need, to, we need to be a lot slower in forming opinions. We need to pray and ask God if there's something behind this behavior that's irritating, show it to me. It's amazing what happens when we just care a little bit more about what God cares about. And we're just not so quick to go with our carnal opinions and our hasty judgments. Paul said, I don't care what you think of me. And then I love this part. He said, I do not even put myself on trial and judge myself. So here we see that we don't, we don't really need to care about other people's judgments because we're going to stand before God in the end. He's the only one that we're really going to have to be accountable to. So you can't let other people and their opinions run your life. And you can't try to run other people's lives with your opinions. So we see that we don't have to be over, overly concerned about what people think of us. We don't even have to judge ourselves. We examine ourselves. But you've got to be very careful that you're not overboard judgmental and critical about every little false move that you make. Then he goes on to say, I'm not conscious of anything against myself, and I feel blameless, but I'm not even vindicated and acquitted before God on that account. It is the Lord himself who examines and judges me. So Paul basically just stayed away from all judgment, although he did bring correction to people on a regular basis in the church. That was part of his job as an apostle was to bring correction. But he didn't get into judging the person's heart. If you don't judge a person's heart, then you can continue to pray for them that that behavior that they have will change. But if you judge them, there's a wall that comes down between you and them, and you begin to shut them out of your life. And if you've got a big mouth, you will also begin to tell everybody else what you think, and then everybody will shut them out of their life. And there are many people who try to come to church looking for God, and Christians treat them that way, and then they think, that God is no good. And I want to tell you, we represent God in the earth, and we need to start treating people the way God would treat them. Somebody say amen. I'm so saddened by people who've gone to church thinking they've tried God, got rejected, got judged, got criticized, didn't find people to be friendly, warm, or loving. And the truth is, is God's not like that at all. But they may think that he was. Actually, instead of staying away from the people that come to church that maybe are a little bit odd and unusual, we, they should be the ones that we befriend. Go to the person that looks the loneliest, the one that nobody wants to have anything to do with. Try to find out what's going on in their life. They're only hurting. People act weird because they're hurting. How many of you have ever acted strange because you were hurting? And boy, wouldn't it have been nice if somebody would have just got to know you a little bit better and found out what was going on in your life. Jesus went around helping people, and that's what our goal should be in life. Verse 5. So do not make any hasty or premature judgments before the time when the Lord comes again. For he will both bring to light the secret things that are now hidden in darkness, and he will disclose and expose the secret aims and motives and purposes of hearts. Then every man will receive his due commendation from God. Now, the word judge is a very interesting word because if you look it up in the Greek dictionary, the main definition means of God. And then it says in the Greek dictionary that when we judge people, we set ourselves up as God. Now, to me, that's pretty scary. Only God has the right to judge a person. Once again, when we get saved, we don't get stupid. We get smarter. We can see if somebody's doing something wrong. But we have to be very careful that what we know about righteousness doesn't become self-righteousness. Because the minute a person becomes self-righteous, they become the most critical, the most judgmental, the most opinionated person on the planet. That's why we must know that we are nothing without God, and our righteousness is like filthy rags, that our own only true righteousness comes from God as a gift, and that without Him, we cannot do anything. Amen. 
Amen. It also means, says it refers to the mental process of determining, forming an opinion, and then condemning. So this judgmental spirit that gets off on people, and we all have it from time to time, but some people are just so judgmental. And some of the most judgmental people that I've ever met in my life were people that appeared to be very, very religious. They had a lot of good behavior. I mean, they had their act polished. In church, every time the church door opened, quoting scriptures, praying all the time, doing all kinds of church work. Well, you know what? God would rather have somebody who makes a few blunders but has a great heart than somebody who has a polished performance and a judgmental, mean, spirited heart that's opinionated and critical. I'm so glad that God is a God of hearts. And that's one thing that always seems to bring people peace, that God sees your heart. When a man was being chosen to replace King Saul, and Nathan the prophet was sent to the house of Jesse to begin to look at his sons, one of whom was David, he went through every single one of them, and they were good looking, and this and that, and something else. But then the Lord would say, that's not the one. That's not the one. That's not the one. That's not the one. And there were no more sons left. There was nobody left to look at. And he said to, to Jesse, don't you have any other sons? And he said, well, I, I do have one young son. He's, he's the keeper of the sheep, and he's just out there in the field, you know, feeding the sheep. David was thought so little of that they didn't even bother to bring him in to be looked at. And the one that people thought the least of was the one that God chose. And I love that. That he chooses the weak and the foolish things of the world that confound the wise. 1 Corinthians says, what everybody else would throw away as trash, God chooses and he uses. Amen? Amen? I know sometimes it's very hard. We think, man, that person's strange. I can't believe God's using them. But I think sometimes God just likes to show out. You know, he picks people that are not very good picks. And I know, because, man, I, I still can't figure out why God's using me, but I mean, I just really don't have anything that a person ought to have to do this. I don't have the right education. Maybe not even the right mannerisms. I don't know. I'm just kind of, you know. I mean, three times yesterday I was dealing with business and I was called Mr. Meyer on the phone. And <laughs> so what does God do? He takes the unusual thing and spreads it all over the world. And I'm sure he thinks it's funny and but it's amazing, you know, when God anoints something, it doesn't really matter what anybody thinks. Our, our opinions just are worthless when God's anointing comes on someone. I mean, David was thought so little of that what they did, whenever his brothers went out to supposedly fight Goliath, although none of them would do it, and David wanted to go see what was going on, he couldn't believe that this one giant was defying the armies of the living God. And he went out to look. His father let him take some, some food to his brothers and to go and check on things. And when he said, what's going to be done for the man who kills this giant? I mean, one of his brothers quickly said, what do you want? With whom have you left those few sheep that you tend to in the wilderness? I mean, they, they had a belittling attitude toward David. And you need to be very careful. If, if even your siblings or people in your family or or teachers or other kids at school when you were growing up belittled you, you need to remember that it's not what people think that matters, it's what God thinks that matters. But we have to dish out to other people what we would love to have in our own life. Let's look at John chapter 8. We're going to begin in the first verse. 
And I'm going to go over quite a few scriptures here. This is the story of how Jesus handled the woman taken in adultery. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives early in the morning at dawn. And he came back into the temple court and the people came to him in crowds. And he sat down and began to teach them. When the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, they made her stand in the middle of the court and put the case before him. So we can already see that they had no tender spirit. They didn't care if they embarrassed the woman. And actually, they only brought her to try to trap Jesus and to see how he would handle the situation. Teacher, they said, this woman's been caught in the very act of adultery. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such women offenders should be stoned. But what do you say that we should do with her? What is your sentence? And they said this to try and to test him, hoping they might find a charge on which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger. Now what is that all about? <laughs> it's amazing what God will show you if you just stop and ask him. Instead of just reading for, for quantity so you can get a check mark on your chapter for the day. And so I asked him one day, what, what were you doing? What? This woman's out here being embarrassed and you're piddling in the ground. Well, he showed me. You know what he was doing? He was taking a moment to see what God had to say about the situation. To see what his father had to say about the situation. I absolutely love that. What would happen when we're in a situation like that where we need to make some kind of a judgment, some kind of an opinion, make some kind of a decision? If we take just that moment to acknowledge God and say, how do you want me to deal with this situation? I think that's beautiful. Well, he bent down and began to write on the ground with his finger. Verse 7, however, when they persisted with their question, he raised himself up and said... Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. Then he bent down and went on writing on the ground with his finger. Now, to me, that's important too because he said just what he needed to, not too much and not too little. And then he got quiet again. And I think what we do sometimes in confrontation is we talk way too much. And then nobody gets anything out of it except mad. And he just said exactly the right thing, just enough, and then he got quiet. And you know why he got quiet? To allow God the opportunity to bring conviction <laughs> in their hearts. He didn't get into a doctrinal dispute and start trying to explain himself 50 ways. He said, well, let, let you know, okay, stoning, that's, that's the law. So, I'll tell you what, whichever one of you has no sin, you go ahead and throw the first stone. And then he just got right back down. I tell you what, I bet the Holy Ghost fell on that place and <laughs> people were sweating bullets. Because <laughs> they knew they'd been had. They knew it. They listened to him. And then they began going out, conscience-stricken one by one, from the oldest down to the last of them, till Jesus was left alone with the woman standing there before him in the center of the court. And when Jesus raised himself up, he said to her, Woman, where are your accusers? Has no man condemned you? And she answered, No one, Lord. She recognized who he was, confessed who he was, and that's really all it takes to get your sins forgiven. No one, Lord. And Jesus said, I do not condemn you either. Go your way, and from now on, sin no more. It's interesting, he didn't even give her a big speech about her bad behavior. He showed her love, he gave her mercy, he gave her forgiveness, and he said, now go and live your life right. Well, I want to encourage you to pray and ask God to teach you how to walk in more love. The Apostle Paul prayed for the church and he said, I pray that you would abound in love. That means that it would grow by leaps and bounds. Treating people right 
treating them the way we would want to be treated is actually love, and it's one of the highest forms of spiritual warfare that we can do. So if you really want to walk in power over the enemy and not let him rule your life, one of the ways you can do it is just to walk in more love. I believe that we need to focus on having a good, strong love walk. We're here at the Hand of Hope Medical Clinic in Angacha, Ethiopia. And Dave, I just wanted to ask you, what, what are you feeling as you come here and see the work that God's allowing us to do? Uh, I'm feeling humbled. I'm feeling thrilled, excited about what God's given us an opportunity to do. Uh, you know, when, when I look at this place, it was a rundown wreck at one time, and now it's so beautiful. The grounds are uh, actually, they say they're therapeutic to the people here, yeah, right. and uh, the people are excited about what what has happened here. But we're excited about what God is doing, how He's helping the people here in Mangacha, Ethiopia. We have the opportunity to yeah. help hurting people, and that's our goal, that's our desire, that's our hunger for, for Joyce Meyer Ministry. Well, one thing's for sure, we certainly love helping people and to see the smiles on the kids' faces and and to see the hope in their parents' eyes is just a, a phenomenal blessing. I can honestly say, I don't think that there's anything in the world that's better or gives you a better feeling than knowing that you're making a positive difference in somebody else's life. I love to be able to put a smile on someone's face. Thank you for helping us do that.